gather together to lift up your name, to call on a Savior, to fall in your grace. Hear the joyful sound of our offering as your saints bow down, as your people sing. We will rise with you. God saves. Amen? Amen? Well, let me ask you questions a little more personal. How many are thankful that God saved you? Amen? Amen? Changed your life, made you new people in Christ. Good to see you this morning. Good to be together. You're looking great. You're looking wonderful. Great to see the sun shining. Great to gather together and worship the Lord. Amen? And those of you that are tuning in online this morning, we welcome you to our service this morning. I'm just looking forward to a great time together. Nothing like getting together as the people of God and recognizing that God is here. And because God is here, all things are possible. So you need to look to him. You need to worship him according to your faith. Be it unto you. Trust the Lord. And we'll believe God for great things because God wants to do some ministry this morning in our hearts and lives. And so let's pray. Ask the Lord. Put everything else aside, all your worries, all your fears. And let's concentrate on the Lord and let's just allow his spirit to work in our midst today. Thank you, Lord, for your awesome presence. Lord, we just recognize that all things are possible when we get together and we look to you and we believe you and we open our hearts and we respond to you in worship. That's what we want to do, Lord. We, we don't worship for ourselves. We worship you because you're here and you deserve our, our best. And so we, we want to give you our best this morning. Minister to our hearts, those that have gathered this morning, those that have come in online. May you, by your spirit, minister to their hearts. May they feel enriched and empowered with your presence. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. In Christ alone. I 
Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless pain, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save, till on the cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. Sin on him was laid. Here in the death of Christ I live. There in the ground his body lay, light of the world by darkness slain. Then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again. And as he stands in victory, since first has lost its grip on me, for I am his and he is mine, bought with the precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life, no fear in death, this is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can never pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ I'll stand. another chorus this morning, a chorus focusing on the cross, recognizing what Jesus did for us on the cross. Of course, this being the first Sunday of the month, we will be participating in communion, so hopefully you received your emblems as you come in. But we're going to sing this song this morning, and as we do that, we're going to actually dismiss our kids, our children. We do have nursery available. We have um, toddler church for children two to four, and we have super church from five to ten. And so as we sing this song, as you worship and focus on the Lord, parents, you can bring your children downstairs, and there'll be leaders there ready to sign them up. RJ is going to lead us in this one. Appreciate RJ. God bless you as you lead us. And above all, worship the Lord as we sing this, and you can bring your children downstairs. Above all powers, above all Kings, above all nature and all created things, above all wisdom and all the ways of man, you were here before the world began. The world of all kingdoms, above all thrones, above all one. The world is ever known Above all wealth and treasures of the earth There's no way to measure what you're worth Crucified, laid behind the stone You live to die, rejected and alone Trampled on the ground, we took the fall. The thought of me above all, above all powers, above all kings, above all nature and all created. Above all wisdom and all the ways of man, you were here before the world began. Above all kingdoms, above all thrones, above all wonders the world has ever known, above all wealth and treasures of the earth. 
There's no way to measure what you're worth. Crucified, laid behind a stone. You live to die, rejected and alone like a rose. Trampled on the ground, you took the fall and thought of me. your precious thank you Jesus thank you for your goodness thank you for your presence here with us this morning thank you for going to the cross for us and dying for us thank you for your presence hallelujah Jesus hallelujah Jesus hallelujah bless your name Jesus amen amen you may be seated Well, again, I want to welcome you here this morning. If you're visiting with us for the first time, we hope that you'll feel right at home as we worship together. There are visitors' cards that you would find in the pew in front of you. If you could take one of those and fill it out, and there's a visitor station that you'll see on the way out this morning at that desk. Fill out your visitors' card, leave it there. I'd love to have a record of your visit with us today. I do want to mention that, uh, again, we, you know, make sure that you, you're picking up a bulletin when you leave. The bulletins are just on the way out, and hopefully you picked up your emblems, as I mentioned earlier. Just let me mention a few announcements very quickly that, uh, first of all, we just want to remind you of the trunk sale that is this Saturday from 8 to 11, and uh, there's, a, there's about 14 people that are hosting out of their vehicles or tables, I mean, for the people that are hosting, they'll be here from 7 to 12. But it'll be 8 to 11. We encourage you to come, and maybe there's something you'll find there that you like. We're selling some things from the church, and some people are starting selling personal items and so on out in the parking lot. And so why don't you come by and enjoy, even come by and visit some fellowship together. Now, I do want to mention something to you. Are you ready for it? Over the last number of months, we've been doing a lot of talking about renovation, and the Lord has been so good in bringing us this far in our renovation plan, I want you to know something that's really important. I want you to know, well, I want you to know that this Tuesday, we have someone coming in to pad the pews. <laughs> now, that can be good and bad, I recognize. <laughs> that can be good or bad, you know. It's, I guess from my perspective, it can be you know, um, I haven't sat in those pews very much, but I know, well, I think I, when I, after I had my heart attack, I sat in those pews for about two months, and I thought, wow, are they ever hard pews? Why, oh, are they ever uncomfortable? How come never, no one ever complains about them? I don't know why. Maybe they just don't tell me. Uh, anyways, uh, starting this Tuesday, I'm not sure if they'll all be done. You know what I'm thinking? I'm thinking, I'm going to tell those people when they come in, I'm going to tell them to make sure they just pad the front five or six rows. That would be a good plan. You know what I think will happen next week? I'll have a major crowd. I just want you to know, you're, some of you are moving up a little closer. That's nice. I was thinking last Sunday, I was thinking, did we not shower? Did we not put deodorant on? How come everyone is like way back there? Love to have you closer and love to just have you here. And looking forward to the padded pews. Once we do the lights underneath the balcony, then we're done, that renovation. And so thank you for supporting that project. We just are so thankful to the Lord for the opportunity to do that. I do want to mention something about ladies' uh, Bible study. We've had a ladies' Bible study that's run, run from September to, to June here. Appreciate Judy for giving a direction to that ladies' Zoom Bible study online. Now that will 
that will stop here for the summer will resume in the fall in September. Just want to thank you ladies for supporting that ministry. Thank you, Judy, for, for giving leadership to that throughout the year. Just looking forward to what the Lord has in store for, for women's ministries in the fall as we, again, we open up and we look for opportunities. Judy, right there. Appreciate your ministry, your faithfulness in this matter. Just appreciate you're so faithful and so dedicated to that ministry. So, so this morning, I want you to take your Bibles and turn to the book of James. Um, we're going to spend most of our time in James this morning, James chapter 1 and James chapter 3. And the, and the scriptures that we'll be using this morning are in your bulletin, and they will come up on PowerPoint. And then there's a thing called your Bible. If you want to use that, that this morning, that would be great. So let me ask you a question as we start. How many of you like going through a car wash? Anyone like going through car washes? A few of you. Throughout the winter, we have to use those this time of year. It's nice to get back to just washing your car. You know, when you go through a car wash, everything is preset to clean your car. So when you drive out, your car looks a lot better than when you went in, hopefully. Did you know that the church of Jesus Christ is like an automated car wash with a human soul? Did you know that? I mean, we decide whether we'll submit to the process. We choose whether or not we're going to align our lives to God's plan and God's will. But once we do that, the Spirit begins to work on us using the circumstances of our lives to transform us into the image of Jesus Christ. That's what we're talking about. The Apostle Paul put it this way in his letter to the church in Rome, Romans, Romans chapter 8. He says, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Now, watch what he says as he goes further. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. Now, here at Elam, our vision is to develop people into fully devoted followers of Christ. That's our vision. What that means is we at Elam want to travel alongside of you, with you, wherever you are in your spiritual journey, and we will do whatever it takes to help you take the next step towards living a Christ-centered life. That's what we're all about, to be a better you, to make a better you. As we look at a better you, we are going to look at the words of James and see what the Bible teaches regarding healthy communication within, within our relationships. Now, some, some years ago, an author by the name of Bob Morehouse wrote an essay called The Paradox of Our Time. Here's just a portion of what he wrote. I'll read it to you. It's right up in front of you, but I, I read it, and it makes you really think. I'll read it for you here this morning. We've learned how to make a living, but not a life. Hmm. We've added years to life, but not life to years. We've been all the way to the moon and back, but we have trouble crossing the street to meet a new neighbor. Isn't that true? We conquered outer space, but not inner space. What a fascinating set of insights. I especially like uh, those last two lines. He said, we've been all the way to the moon and back, but we have trouble crossing the street to meet a new neighbor. I've got some new neighbors moving in. Boy, that's so true. So true. We've conquered outer space, but not inner space, the space of your soul. Of all the challenges this world presents to us, the greatest challenge, you know what that is? That's ourselves. That's you. The greatest challenge is the person who is facing, uh, facing us in the mirror every day, every day. When I say facing us in the mirror, I'm not so much talking about what we see as I'm talking about who we see. I'm not talking about the outer space in our lives. I'm talking about the inner space of our life and our soul. Here, I'm not talking about the state of your hair. Amen. Not the state of your hair, because I haven't had to comb my hair for years. I'm talking about the state of your heart. That's what we're talking about this morning, the state of your heart. Now, folks, the last two years have placed a stress on us the last two years have strained lives. The last two years have strained relationships. Some relationships to the breaking point. Let's be honest. I mean, the events of our last two years have divided people 
in so many ways. They've divided people politically within the pandemic. There's all kinds of things that we have to disagree with. We had things to disagree before, and we got a lot of things to disagree about now. And I've seen individuals, relationships, families, churches divided and destroyed. You've seen that as well as I have. So how should a person respond to a crisis like this? I mean, how can a person turn the obstacle of relational stress into an opportunity for relational growth? That's a good question to think about this morning. This is where the little New Testament book known as James becomes incredibly relevant for us today. Now, James was a brother of Jesus, and James was a leader in the first century church. 2,000 years ago, James wrote a letter, and we have a copy of that letter in our Bibles today. It was written to a stressed out, scattered, oppressed group of Jewish followers of Jesus who were just barely clinging to their faith. And James advises them back then, speaks with amazing clarity to us today. Now, there's a tiny snippet of advice from James that we're going to focus on for the next two weeks. We're going to focus on and kind of unpack it for you. It's a simple but profound declaration he makes in chapter 1, James chapter 1, verses 19 to 20. Now, essentially, James is answering the question for us this morning. So what's the best way to respond to relationships when the pressure's on and the stress is building, when you feel like you're going to lose it? What's the best way to handle that? We're going to pay very careful attention to see how James answers that question. Watch what he says this morning. He says these words, My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Now, this passage appears simple, but I, I have to confess to you this morning... Putting it into practice is and will be a daily challenge. But we're going to dive deep into these words and apply them to our lives and our relationships with the goal of building a better you. That's what we want to do this morning. Now, we are beginning today by zeroing on the phrase, everyone should be slow to speak. Slow to speak. When James wrote this, he didn't really write this, I don't think, chronologically. We can pick and choose the order that we, that we address this morning as we go at it. We are starting with that phrase, be slow to speak. Everyone should be slow to speak. And so the question is why? Why should we be slow to speak? I mean, what does that even mean? Is James saying that we should speak like this? Is that the way we want to speak on the foyer? How are you today? Fine. Okay. That's, no, that's not what he's talking about at all. When, when you read the phrase in context, James is not recommending that we speak slowly. James is recognizing, recommending that we speak less. That's what he's doing. When you look at the full context, James is recommending that a key to maintaining relationships under, under stress is to listen more and talk less and restrain our anger. That's what he's saying to us here. So how does being slow to speak contribute to relationship health? That's a good question. What is James seeing and experiencing that he is trying to correct and trying to avoid? A little bit later in James' letter, he goes on a little bit of a rant. He goes on a rant when it comes to the words that we say to one another and the potential of destruction for these words. Listen to what he says in James chapter 3. When, listen to what he says. He says, Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all struggle in many ways. Anyone who's never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. So let me just stop for a second. James seems to be implying here that the content of our words can reveal actually the state of our soul. That's where he's going with this. And so we continue to build on what he's saying. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, 
We can turn the whole animal or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. All kinds of animals and birds and reptiles and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. And let's think about what James has just said there. I can't help but think that there, there, has, there has to be a story behind this writing. There has to be, there, there's got to be a history behind the insight that he's sharing with us today. I can't help but think that James, I, I, that James is personally seeing destructive power on the tongue. I can't help but think that James has personally tasted the poison, maybe at some point, of an untamed tongue. Maybe he was remembering someone else's acidic comments. Maybe. Maybe he was regretting some careless comments of his own. When was the last time, folks, let me ask you this question this morning. When was the last time you actually listened to yourself speak? When's the last time? Of course, it's, it's my job to speak regularly. That's, that's my job. So with online ministry... I, I actually, once in a while, listen to myself occasionally. I do. If, uh, if I'm looking to get down, I'll listen to myself. That can be a very painful process. I, I remember the first time I heard myself speak. I, I heard a recording of myself. I have to confess to you, it was terrible. I mean, I heard all my habits, all my little idiosyncrasies. I, I have to confess, I didn't like what I was hearing. I thought, you know, oh my goodness, is that what people are listening to? I mean, why do people even come back? And you're probably thinking about that this morning. Don't leave quickly, okay? I mean, how do you sound to the people around you? Under stress, how do you treat people in your relationship or of it? What kind of words tend to roll off your tongue when... When the pressure's on and, and things get tough, what kind of things come out of your mouth? Words can come easy when life is easy, but what tends, <clears throat> what tends to bubble up from within you and spread to those around you when your heart is, is not right, when your heart is in turmoil, when things are not right within your soul? James is telling us <clears throat> that we need to think about these things. We need to assess ourselves. He's telling us that we need to pay attention to how we communicate in the relationships of our lives. And James is telling us that one way that we can ensure we're healthy in the communication is to be slow to speak. Okay, so practically speaking, how can being slow to speak help us to be better and more healthy communicators in life, in our relationships? Good question. How would being slow to speak improve, improve our relationships in life? Well, I can think of two ways that I'll share with you this morning. Here's the first way. You ready for it? Ready? Wide awake? Being slow to speak should decrease the damage produced by careless words. It'll decrease the damage produced by careless words. Okay, you're angry at someone. And you want to lash out. You want to give that person a piece of your mind. You want to do that. Careful. How much? Maybe there's not a lot up there. I'm not sure. With me, that's true. So what should you do? You're angry. You want to vent. You want to let her go. What should you do? Well, a common bit of advice that has been passed down to me, when you want to lash out, what you do is you sit down and you write that person a letter. You put down on paper everything that you're thinking, everything that you're feeling. And you know what you do after you're finished writing it? You sign it, you seal it, but you do not send it. Tuck it in your drawer. Put it somewhere no one can find it, okay? Sleep on it. Put it in a file. And maybe in a few days, once things settle down and your heart is in a better position, then, you know, revisit it. Pull it out. Open it up. Read it again. You will likely be amazed at how, how, how glad you're going to be 
that you didn't send that letter. You'll really be happy that you didn't send it. You will likely discover that with distance and time comes better perspective. Better perspective, better attitude, a cleaner heart. Why is this true? Why is that true? Well, it's true because it's a universal experience. That generally speaking, our first response is really our best response. Did you know that? Your first reaction, especially when you're angry, is, is rarely your best response. Listen, I've been writing sermons for, for 36 years. That's a lot of years. You need to know that what you're hearing me say right now is not the first draft. You need to know that. I usually walk through many drafts and revisions. I process things in my mind over time for a while. I bounce thoughts off of people. You know, my poor wife over the years bounce thoughts, you know, give my, you know, off, off my wife and so on. That's kind of the process that I work through my thoughts. I, I do that. When you hear a sermon, rarely are you hearing the first draft. It's the same with speechwriters, with politicians. You're not going to hear the first draft of that speech. It's the same with songs and songwriters. You need to know that the song that you hear recorded was not the first draft. There, there are many drafts before the final copy. For example, there's a famous saying. We all know this saying. It's a saying that goes like this. If, if life hands you lemons, you make what? You make lemonade, right? Few people know that the first draft of that phrase was, if life hands you lemons, make some kind of fruity juice. Now, how many know that needs a little bit of revision, right? That need, they needed to work on that one. Proverbs says these words. Do you see someone who speaks in haste? The Bible says, there is more hope for a fool than for them. That's pretty strong words. By the way, this is the danger of social media. Here's the danger of social media. This, what, this is what makes media like Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, it makes it so toxic sometimes. I mean, it's a realm of instant feedback. I'm convinced if James was around today, I'm certain he would say, be slow to type, be slow to text, be slow to tweet. I mean, have you ever typed or texted or tweeted something that you regret? I'm sure you have. It was spontaneous. You got triggered. I mean, you, 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 you bit on the bait and you got dragged in, into it in the situation. And now you wished you kept your mouth shut and your finger, finger still. That's the whole realm, really, of cancel culture today. People are discovering that, that old tweets and old quotes and old online posts are coming back to kind of haunt them. Listen, when you put something online, you know what, folks? It's there forever. Oh, you can delete it, but it lives in cyberspace forever. What's true of the type word is also true of the spoken word. When you speak a word to somebody, when you release a thought and send it towards them as a sound wave, it doesn't end in their eardrums. It sinks into their brain and it ultimately soaks into their soul. That's what it does. The Bible says the tongue has the power of life and death. And isn't that so true? Practically speaking, how would being slow to speak improve our relationships well, I'm suggesting I can think of two ways this morning. Number one, being slow to speak should decrease the damage caused by careless words. This is true because, generally speaking, because our first response is rarely our best response. Right? You with me on that? Number two, there's another way I think that being slow to speak will improve our relationship. Here it is this morning. Being slow to speak should not only decrease the damage recruit, uh, you know, produced by careless words, but being slow to speak should increase the quality produced by thoughtful words. It, in, it increases the quality produced by thoughtful words. James is teaching here that when it comes to words, patience is a way to excellence. Being slow to speak should increase the quality of thoughtful words. Now, why is that true? Good question. This is true because slowing down our response times means wrapping up our reflection time. That's what's happening. You see, when I hold my tongue, when I intentionally decide to be slow to speak, 
I'm doing more than just being silent. When we slow down our response time, we, when we pause before we begin to speak things to other people, we're really making time for God to speak to us. That's what we're doing. And when we do that, we're increasing the opportunity for us to speak words of life instead of words that kill. Scripture has been telling us for centuries that we need to be careful with our words. The writer in the Old Testament, Solomon, says these words. He said, do not be quick with your mouth. Do not be hasty in your heart to utter anything before God. God is in heaven and you are on earth, so let your words be few. The immediate context of that passage is dealing with those who make rash promises and utter insincere vows. But we understand what he's saying. The Apostle Paul made this observation regarding to how to, how to respond to people where you're in the, when you're in the spotlight and you're under pressure. He said these words. Watch what he says in Colossians. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. So when, you're, when you put these two passages together, you get a good picture of reality. Every word you speak is spoken in the presence of God. God is present. God is listening. But he's not only present to listen. He's also present to equip, to guide you, to guide you with the right things to say in the situation. He is present to fill your mind with his grace. So don't be in a hurry to respond to a question or a remark on a situation. Pause. Pause. You know what? Take some time. Take, take, a step, take a step back, especially when you're under a lot of pressure. Access his presence and let your response be godly. Let your response be gracious and let your response be wise and constructive. Being slow to speak should increase the quality produced by thoughtful words because slowing down our response time means ramping up our reflection time. I take a step back, allow my heart to settle, I make sure my heart is right, I have time to think it through, process it, and come back with something that is constructive and not destructive. Now, this brings us to the big idea where we summarize the teaching in one phrase. You say, Pastor, if you could summarize this sermon in one phrase, here it is. You have already can see it. Here it is. Decreasing the quantity of our words goes a long way towards increasing the quality of our words. Really. Intentionally pausing before speaking makes room for God in your relationship. Intentionally pausing before speaking not only makes room for God to protect you from uttering harmful words, but it also makes room for God to inject you with helpful words so you can speak constructive words. Do you want to know how to improve the quality of your relationships? Be slow to speak because words matter. Words have the power of life and death. They matter. Decreasing the quantity of your words goes a long way to increasing the quality of your words. How do you communicate under pressure? What kind of words come out of your mouth when life isn't going as planned? What kind of words come out of your mouth? Well, today James has given us some solid practical advice. Very simple things, tough to practice, but here it is. Be slow to speak. Be slow to speak. Instead of pouncing, try praying. Give yourself time to guard your heart and give God time to tame your tongue so you say constructive things. Doing so will turn a potentially harmful exchange into a powerfully helpful exchange if we practice what God says. Now, as we talk about this today, maybe you're reminded of an instance where you spoke harsh words, some strong words criticize somebody, run someone down, reacted quickly, where your words sliced and diced someone in, it's in your contact. Did you know that, that it's never too late to, to go back and make things right, folks? 
never too late to go back, swallow your pride, go back and say, you know what? What I said was wrong. We need to talk. There are some things we need to talk about, but the way I responded to you is not right. In this message, maybe God has brought to your mind instances where you should have been slow to speak. It's never too late to offer that healing. It's never too late to to go and make things right. And what an opportunity that is. You know, here we are going to be moving into communion, and we focus on the cross. We thank God for the cross. And it's all about Jesus and him dying on the cross. But you remember what it says, what the Apostle Paul says in the context of the passage in 1 Corinthians? Examine yourself, right? Good opportunity to examine ourselves. And this is a good area for us really to examine ourselves. Maybe you're in conflict. Maybe you said things. Things were said that shouldn't have been said. You say, Lord, forgive me of my sin. Cleanse me, Lord. Help me, Lord. And I leave this place that I would go and make things right with that person so we can move on it's not that we don't talk about issues it's not that we don't talk with boat and tackle tough issues we're not sweeping things under the carpet we just don't want to come with harsh words destructive words you understand what i mean this morning be slow to speak bow your heads with me close your eyes it's time to just examine our hearts and allow the holy spirit to do his work this morning, Lord, uh, we want to be a better person. It's, it's you that makes us like your son, Jesus Christ. And what an area to focus on this morning. When we talk about an area that we all struggle with, the area of our words, things that are said, shouldn't have been said to a person, maybe even behind somebody's back, and gossip and slander and so on. Oh, God, I pray that we would learn the lesson today of being slow to speak. And when we walk into those situations, and we all do, pressure situations, someone says something, we respond quickly back to them with some harsh words. Oh, what a great advice. That's great advice for us to stop, be slow to speak, so that we can be constructive. And I say this morning, Lord, as we examine our hearts, we examine our lives today, that, Lord, we would confess those things that are not right in our hearts right now. Make things right with you and allow your precious Holy Spirit to work in our lives and your precious blood to wash us, make us clean. And we pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 We're going to sing the song once again, focusing on the cross. Just want you to worship with us. Hopefully you have your emblems following this song. We're going to, we're going to walk you through taking the emblem, participating. But worship the Lord. Thank the Lord for the cross. Amen. You thankful for him? Amen. Let's worship the Lord. We sing together. Jesus Christ, I think upon your sacrifice. You became nothing, poured out to death many times. Wondered at your gift of life, and I'm in that place once again. I'm in that place once again. Once again, I look upon the cross where you died. I'm humbled by your mercy, and I'm broken inside. Once again I thank you, once again I pour out my life. Now you are exalted to the highest place, King of the heavens, where one day I'll bow. But for now, I marvel at this saving grace, I'm full of praise once again. I'm full of praise once again. Once again I look upon the cross where you died. I'm humbled by your mercy and I'm broken inside. Once again I thank you. 
Once again I pour out my life. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the cross, my friend. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the cross, my friend. Once again I look upon the cross where you died. I'm humbled by your mercy and I'm broken inside. Once again I thank you. Once again I pour up my life. cross. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the cross, my friend. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the cross, my friend. Hallelujah, Jesus. We thank you for the cross. We thank you, Jesus, for what you've done on the cross. Hallelujah. We read from the scriptures, and of course, you have your emblems with you, and just to kind of give you a little direction with these emblems, for those of you that are fairly new, does everyone have an emblem here? Everyone's fine? You make sure that you um, there's, recognize there's two layers to this. The first one, you get into your wafer, and then your second one, you get into the juice. If you take the second one, there'll be no wafers this morning. Sorry. So we read the scriptures, reminding what the Apostle Paul said to us this morning as we think about the cross, we think about what Jesus did for us on the cross, and we thank him for that. It says, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread like we're taking it, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And so let's partake of the wafer together. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your your body that was broken for us. We thank you, Jesus, that by your stripes we are healed. Oh, Jesus. And so we claim that healing in Jesus' name this morning for each person. We pray for ministry to people with physical needs, Lord. Touch and heal them and restore them. We pray for that in Jesus' name. Today, we pray for that. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. And so let's partake of the cup together. Hallelujah, Jesus. And we're so thankful again, Lord, for the precious blood of Jesus Christ. We recognize without the shedding of blood, there is no remission, no forgiveness of sin, but because of your precious blood. Lord, when we made a decision to follow you, you came into our life and you cleansed us from all our sin and made us new people in Christ. And I think, Lord, even as followers of Christ, Lord, how important it is Not that we get saved every day, because we get saved, we find Jesus as our Savior. But the fact is, every day we wrestle with sin. We say things, we do things we shouldn't. But I'm so thankful that the Bible says to us, very directly it says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to cleanse us and wash us, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so I pray in this place this morning that you're washing us, that you're cleansing our hearts that you're purifying our souls this morning, that when we leave this place, our hearts would be right with you. And thus, that would affect us in our relationships. You will make us a better person. Lord, we take time to remember some individuals in prayer today. I think of Judy's two cousins. We've been praying for them for the last few months. Lord, we just pray that you would touch them and heal them. Just intervene on their behalf. Be an ever-present help. Divinely touch them in Jesus' name. Today, we pray for them. I think of Ed, who is Pastor Ed, who's in Toronto. 
and still receiving treatment as he walks through this treatment. Three weeks in, probably another week to go. All that he's going through with his own health and the fact that his wife has passed away, God ministered what he ministered to his soul, ministered to his spirit. May he know that there's a family of God that has met together, that's meeting together today, that is praying on his behalf and care about him, care about his, his, just his, even his family as they walk through this difficult time. We think of Bob Burr Thompson, who also, Lord, is the last few months is, is, is grieving the loss of his wife and is recognizing, Lord, even in my visit with him a few days ago, recognizing that his days are short. May you just be with him today. Minister to him. Touch him. and Just and may he sense your presence, Lord. I know that his number one desire, Lord, is you talk to him. You talk about heaven. He can hardly talk. He's so excited that he's going to see Jesus so soon. We're just, we just pray that you would be with him through this time. We think of sin and marriage. Minister to them. Touch their bodies, we pray. Encourage their hearts. And others that are here and those that are alive, may, may we just sense your presence. May we just sense your grace and your love for those relationships that are intense and struggling. God, that you would come and bring peace. And may there be good communication that will be taking place. Minister to our hearts today in a special way. We pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Stand with me this morning. We want to sing How Great Is Our God, and it's going to be kind of like our closing song this morning. And I, I do want to mention that as you leave this morning, that if you're, you're giving, just reminding that there are off an offering, there's an offering plate at the back. If you're giving via your envelopes, just you can give that way or online. There's ways to give, e transfer. And many of you know if you're visiting, if you have questions about that, you want to be involved in that, we want to make you aware of that. But folks, how great is our God, amen? I'm so glad that our God is awesome and great. Sometimes we get focused on ourselves and things. Oh, how important it is to look heavenward and recognize, even though we live in a broken world and there's been a lot of struggles and you've dealt with a lot of struggles, oh, how great is our God. Let's just worship him. Let's love him this morning as Steve leads us in this. Sorry. 
so glad that you're great and you're awesome. I'm so glad that you're in control, Lord, and that we as followers of Christ can follow you and look to you and trust you even in the darkest of challenges, even the greatest disappointments. Our eyes can be fixed on the author and the finisher of our faith and know that you never change. You're faithful. You're all-powerful. There's nothing that you can do as we call upon your name. So our faith rises to you this morning. Thank you for your presence today. Thank you, Lord, that you're transforming us. You're making us more like your son. You're making us a, a better you, a better us, every one of us. May we surrender and submit to your control that we might act and talk way you want us to. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As you're leaving this morning, we're going to sing that song. The splendor of the King Clothed in majesty Let all the earth rejoice All the earth rejoice He rides himself in light and darkness tries to hide and trembles at his voice and trembles at his voice how great is our God sing with me how great is our God and all will see how great Oh, yeah. 